Greetings. This talk will be discussing the topic of immunohistochemistry. My name is Alan Meeker, and I'm a faculty member at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. You can see my contact info here. Please feel free to email me with any comments or questions uh, that you may have after this presentation. So we're going to get started. I'm covering a fair bit of material, so I'll probably be going at a relatively quick pace, but since this is recorded, Hopefully that should not be a problem. You can go back and re-review any of the material that uh, you may have uh, uh, not caught on the first pass. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. The goal here is for you to gain a basic understanding of tissue-based immunostaining as well as its applications. And so what we'll be covering are reasons uh, why you might want to do immunostaining, what type of data results you can expect to obtain from that, what kind of questions can you answer, uh, the basics of antibodies, uh, a little bit we'll go into that, how they work, uh, something that's very important, which is called a pre-analytical uh, set of variables. These include procedures that happen prior to the staining itself and the readouts, uh, and in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, the fixation of tissue samples can be critically important uh, in, in getting uh, optimal results. And so we're going to spend some time on that because it is rather <clears throat> an important consideration. Uh, we'll go over some of the methodology, <clears throat> applications, and then potential problems, again, similar to the pre-analytical <clears throat> subject uh, to be aware of going forward when using this technique. So the technique most people are actually familiar with is called immunohistochemistry or IHC. Uh, you often see pictures like this in textbooks and lectures where you see sort of a brown stain uh, overlaying cells and tissues uh, from a photomicrograph. The goal here in this technique is for us to be able to localize specific molecules of interest within cells and tissues and within their structures. This is based on recognizing uh, antibody recognition of its specific target. Uh, um, the, one of the biggest benefits of performing immunohistochemistry is this localization of the signal. <clears throat> so this is where the histo part comes from and histo technology and histo chemistry. We'll be looking at uh, oftentimes in tissues. So you get a lot of clues as to what's going on by looking at the tissue-based architecture uh, and see what types of individual cells or structures or even subcellular structures are visible uh, for you and where your target is located. So antibodies you, you may already be somewhat familiar with. <clears throat> Very uh, typically they're shown as this sort of Y-shaped cartoon. Uh, it's, a, it's a protein with a sort of a, a domain here that can be considered a sort of handle, uh, which we use to label antibodies, uh, either for detection by fluorescence or, or chromogenic substrates. There are two antigen binding uh, domains here on these arms, a sort of Y-shaped molecule, each of which recognizes the same part of a typically larger uh, antigen or the target molecule of interest. That part of the molecule that the antibody will recognize <clears throat> is called the epitope. So the antibody can actually bind two of the same target molecules if it encounters them. Uh, antibodies have particular specificities as well as affinities for the target, for the epitope, and they can vary from antibody to antibody. And what we're taking advantage of here is the biological system that generates this enormous diversity of antibodies. So basically your immune system can generate antibodies to essentially <clears throat> any molecule in nature. Um, and so that's really what we're going to be taking advantage of, finding antibodies that then act as detection or binding reagents for your target of interest. So in this cartoon, again, not drawn to scale and not even shown exactly how the antibody is bound properly, which would be actually at the, the termini here of these antigen binding domains, one or the other. But nonetheless, <clears throat> using this cartoon representation that's very commonly used, this is basically the, the concept here of an antibody molecule binding to a target antigen. Um, and this is termed the antigen antibody complex. And it is this that is the fundamental event <clears throat> uh, or structure that all immunostaining relies on. And there are various uh, strategies then for detecting whether this has happened, where it is, um, et cetera. 
This antibody that directly binds the antigen of the target of interest is known as the primary antibody. And that becomes clear here because oftentimes how these are detected is to use then another antibody termed the secondary antibody, which actually has been raised in such a way that it is specific then for the primary antibody itself. So the primary antibody becomes the target, an epitope for the secondary antibody. <clears throat> and this is basically binding here again to this handle, this FC region that is not involved in antigen binding itself to the primary antibody's target. Um, characteristics, there are two main ones you really have to be aware of. There are two broad types of antibodies. One is called polyclonal. A polyclonal antibody is basically a mixture of several different individual antibody types and, and copies of those types, all of which bind different uh, epitopes on the antigen. So antigens tend to be larger macromolecules such as proteins, <clears throat> and they'll have multiple sites that can act as epitopes for antibodies. So for instance, if we were to inject this particular uh, antigen into uh, the bloodstream of a rabbit, its immune system would recognize it as foreign and it would develop a number of different antibodies that would recognize and bind and try to eliminate this uh, macromolecule. If we then isolated antibodies from the serum of that rabbit and purified them, we would end up with a collection such as shown here in this schematic diagram of different individual antibodies that each recognize independent epitopes on the same macromolecular structure. A monoclonal antibody, uh, in contrast, is actually identical copies of exactly the same single antibody molecule. All the same, they all have the same antigen recognition domain, so they only recognize one epitope on the molecule, and they all recognize that one epitope. Uh, these are usually produced these days commercially in laboratories using tissue culture cells that spit out vast quantities of these specific antibodies, <clears throat> and then they're purified. So differences uh, in general tend to be in the realm of sensitivity and specificity. So uh, polyclonal antibodies tend to be more sensitive because you're basically binding more individual separate antibodies onto your target, which can then be recognized and basically boost your signal up. Um, however, they have potential for being less specific because every time uh, an antibody is created to the binding site, the epitope that you're interested in, there's always a chance that somewhere there's going to be a similar enough macromolecular structure that it might have some binding affinity for that as well, not of the target you're interested in. So that would be an off-target undesired effect. And so the more antibodies you have, the more probability you have that that might occur. And so then your, your, your specificity may be somewhat decreased compared to say a monoclonal antibody. On the other hand, the monoclonal won't have as good a sensitivity potentially because only a single antibody molecule will bind to each um, target molecule. Although in the modern era, <clears throat> these concerns are not quite as bad, especially the sensitivity uh, issue because we can greatly amplify signals these days, which we'll go over uh, soon. Okay, tissue fixation, we definitely want to spend a little bit of time on. This is one of the pre-analytical uh, processes or variables I mentioned early on. Uh, the goals here are to take a piece of, of living tissue and to, to treat it in such a way to prevent its self-digestion or autolysis by rapidly stopping all enzymatic activities. Uh, also to preserve the tissue structure, which is obviously usually what you want in terms of histology. And we want to stabilize and also harden the tissue because most tissue is, is fairly soft. It's difficult to deal with. Certainly, if you want to cut extremely thin sections onto microscope slides, it's going to be almost impossible to do without hardening that tissue. And then also to prevent any type of microbial contamination present from decomposing and basically eating your tissue sample. So one way you can think about this is like, a, a biological sample being a piece of tissue is actually a biological entity. <clears throat> it's much like the food in our refrigerator. So we refrigerate the food for some of these same reasons to prevent microbial uh, degradation and, and to prevent some of the autolysis, although you know, it doesn't always work. Over time, it'll eventually go bad. We don't want that happening to our specimens. So we want to fix them permanently and more rapidly. An ideal fixative would have the following properties. It would be fast, safe, easy to use, not cost very much, and, and do these, these functions that I talked about, all without introducing any types of artifactual uh, 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 structures in the tissues. Unfortunately, this 
ideal fixative actually does not exist. And you're always doing some types of trade-offs amongst these uh, various uh, features. Uh, however, <clears throat> proper fixation, as I mentioned, is critical to the success of your downstream applications. So if, if the tissue is not properly fixed up front, there's really no way to go back. There's, there's nothing you, that's unrecoverable, and it may not be readily apparent at that point in time. It may be a long time down the road when you finally get your end results back that are then um, not re either not reliable or negative. So we're using the old uh, adage from the computer world, garbage in, <clears throat> garbage out. If you start with bad tissues up front, there's nothing we're going to be able to do to fix that problem downstream. The most common fixative is uh, formaldehyde. It's the smallest aldehyde. It's actually a gas, <clears throat> which is fairly soluble in water. And you can saturate a solution to 37%. And if you do that, that creates a solution that is more commonly referred to as formalin, which you may have heard of. This in turn is usually diluted uh, to a 10% level um, of neutral buffered formalin or NBF, uh, which is actually a final concentration of 4% formaldehyde. So um, this is what most people use um, in the lab routinely to fix uh, tissues. Primarily what it does is it forms covalent crosslinks between amino acids and proteins, thus stabilizing and hardening, as well as inactivating enzymes and killing <clears throat> any microbes. Um, there are several key factors during fixation that can affect the, the, uh, the suitability of the fixation, the quality of the fixation, how long it takes, uh, and that depends on the fixative type, the concentration that you use, uh, any salts uh, that are present, what the pH of the solution is, what the temperature is, are you fixing at room temperature, are you fixing at minus or, or at four degrees, uh, incubation time certainly has a lot uh, to do with it. If you don't incubate for a sufficient amount of time, your fixation will be incomplete. <clears throat> and the tissue type can play a role also. Denser tissues, uh, thicker tissues, tissues especially that have a lot of adipose or fat and, be, and are relatively hydrophobic tend to uh, limit and retard the penetration of the formalin solutions, which are aqueous, down into the tissues where they can act. <clears throat> Another point to note here which is true of a number of uh, aspects of, of, of immunostaining, which I'll point out, is that there's a lack of a, a broad lack of standardization for these types of procedures. Each lab's fixation uh, is is re relatively uh, unique. Therefore, the tissues that come out are going to be unique in terms of their fixation extent and qualities. This is important to realize if you're say running a study where you're going to be obtaining multiple tissue samples from say separate institutions. You can't, in fact, you shouldn't assume that those tissue samples are going to all behave equivalently in your immunostaining assays uh, because they probably won't. And they'll probably require some amount of optimization for each uh, source to get uh, uh, coherent results across your sample set. I wanted to point this out in case you're uh, actually doing any of the fixation yourself. One of the main factors here in terms of formalin fixation is the specimen size and the dimensions. So this is very important. You've got a specimen immersed in formalin solution. <clears throat> that formalin has to diffuse into the sample. It's not a very rapid um, process. In fact, it diffuses at a rate of about a millimeter an hour. So if you consider, say, a 10 millimeter specimen in diameter, it's gonna take five hours for the formalin to pass through into the center from all sides. Um, and then it takes some amount of time also for the chemical reaction to occur. That's not instantaneous. So all that is uh, to say that there's actually a, uh, essentially a gradient of fixation that occurs in larger specimens, well fixed on the outside and the periphery, less so perhaps on the inside. In fact, the limiting case is where the center is not fixed at all because maybe the formalin didn't even make it into the center in which case you're going to have basically um, degrading, autolyzing uh, tissues in the center, which are going to be worthless. <clears throat> and this can uh, evidence itself in, in terms of gradients of signals. So here's just an example in a lymph node using a, 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 an anti-CD4 sort of 45 antibody that would be expected to, to darkly stain the surface of pretty much all of these uh, lymphocytes here in this lymph node. You can appreciate this very strong gradient starting from the exterior of the lymph node out here where you get very nice solid brown staining of these cells, which then fades out and gets 
dimmer as you go in towards the interior and in fact becomes essentially negative. Again, this interior might not even be uh, uh, completely fixed at all. Um, so, you know, we do know the expected <clears throat> outcome for this stain would be uniformly brown. So we know this is incorrect. However, imagine doing a stain where you don't know what to expect. You have an improperly fixed specimen. You might wrongly conclude that whatever your target of interest is, is say selectively or, or, or overexpressed out here on the periphery of the tissue not expressed at all or present in the interior, and you'd have a wrong conclusion. Uh, related to this is also uh, the use of, uh, of, is, of essentially enough volume to get good fixation. So uh, rule of thumb is a minimum volume uh, of tissue volume equivalent would be 15 to 20, and no reason not to use more <clears throat> volumes of formalin to the tissue you're trying to fix. So um, I'm in charge of a, of a histology uh, core facility here at the university. And this is an example of a very, a very bad uh, tissue submission we had to the core one day where you can see the, the tissue volume uh, way exceeds the volume of formalin. This specimen is obviously not going to fix well, not going to fix thoroughly at all. Um, and formalin is not very expensive, uh, uh, all things being considered. There's no reason not to use a, a good volume of formalin. So just a rule of thumb to keep in mind if you're in control of uh, fixing these tissues. Um, so again, the fixation process itself with formalin is it's a cross-linking process. So in this cartoon, you can, you can make out here, let's say this is a cell and here's the cytoplasm and some of the cytoplasmic proteins have been cross-linked together to form this sort of net-like structure. Antibody molecules are actually relatively large. And uh, this cross-linking can actually impede the ability of antibodies to cross through this cross-linked uh, barrier to try and get at say its antigen here <clears throat> for instance, we're saying is, a, is an antigen uh, protein on the surface of the nucleus. Um, so this was an issue. Historically, it was actually thought that antigens were destroyed by formalin fixation, but it was later found that uh, treated with a protease can actually help re-expose these antigens, so-called antigen retrieval. So the protease uh, can degrade, partially degrade some of these crosslinks, allowing the antibody to get in to recognize its target on the interior. Uh, proteases are a little difficult to deal with uh, in terms of uh, non-reproducibility, and, and it, it's just one more step you don't want to have to deal with. So fortunately, in the 1980s, it was discovered that this crosslink reversal can actually be affected by heating as well in, in buffered solutions. So that's much more controllable. Um, however, the optimal conditions for this heat-induced antigen retrieval or heat-induced epitope retrieval, is, as it's called, H-I-E-R, are actually determined empirically. And they can vary depending on the tissue type, uh, the details of the fixation, what type of fixation was it, how, how much was it fixed, how long was it stored, has it been stored for years at room temperature, et cetera, how old are the slides, and even the antibody and the target themselves, um, different antibodies and targets, can behave more or less optimally in the staining procedure, depending on the conditions of this heat-induced retrieval. So there are a number of different buffers that can be used, uh, having different pHs and, 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 and different, uh, different ions in them, heat sources, anywhere from heat plates, to microwaves, to autoclaves, to pressure cookers, and different times of heating can, can vary uh, how well this works. So again, it's, it's a very uh, empirically derived process. And this is another aspect uh, for immunostaining labs, where there's a lot of lab-to-lab -lab variability. So again, um, if you're trying to do uh, an antibody stain on, on your tissues and you've gotten a protocol, yeah, see if you can get the details of actually the heat-induced epitope retrieval that they use, this pre precise details that will help you reproduce those results um, in your own lab. And this is just an example, a pretty dramatic example of how important these pretreatments can be. They can basically be make or break or even worse, intermediate. So here's an example where we were staining with a, uh, an antibody against a, a DNA, uh, modified DNA base, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, which we know for the biology of this tissue, most cells should have plenty of this uh, uh, molecule uh, on their DNA in all the nuclei. <clears throat> So here's an example of, a, of a, a slide where there was no pretreatment at all done. It was just rehydrated. And so you get no signals. Um, here's one where heat-induced retrieval was performed with a citrate buffer. And again, 
almost no signals. Here's one where an acid pretreatment step was done, and now we're finally starting to see some pretty nice signals here, but only in a few selected cells, only in the stromal compartment of this tissue, not in the epithelium. So it was only when these two were combined did we start to get the robust uh, staining we were expecting. And we were e expecting this because we knew ahead of time, again, what to expect, that almost all of these cells should have good staining. So this was then helping us to optimize and validate the antibody was working and that we would have the expected staining pattern when we went into other tissue samples. Whereas, you know, if we had just tried, say, this acid treatment, uh, and assumed that the signals we're getting were, were the, the real signals and the only signals that were there in the tissue, we could wrongly conclude that whatever this protein is, it's only, or target is, it's only present in a small subset of cells in the stroma. You know, and pu uh, papers get published with these types of results where improper or, or no validation or optimizations were performed uh, on, on uh, tissues of interest using uh, controls. So again, this is a problem you have to really be careful about. You know, are the pretreatments um, proper for to get optimal staining with the antibody you're trying to use for the target you're trying to detect? So um, having given a couple of those uh, <coughs> caveats and warnings to things to look out for, what uh, would you want to use immunostaining for? Well, it's widely used in discovery in terms of uh, moving from so-called omics platforms such as transcriptomics into cells and tissues to look, let's say, uh, using an RNA transcriptomics, I've got a signal that a certain gene seems to be overexpressed in whatever I'm interested in, say a cancer versus normal, but I've done it in a test tube fashion by grinding up tissues. I don't know what cells or tissues this uh, RNA is actually, actually expressed in. I don't even know whether it's really translated into protein um, and overexpressed at that level. So doing an antibody stain for the protein can give you that type of, of information. It's very helpful in terms of using the same type of thing, but also in preclinical models as well for confirming that your preclinical model is uh, what you think it is. Say for a knockout, uh, you can do an antibody stain in a tissue and you shouldn't see any signal or a, vice versa, a knock-in to see that that signal is actually present. And if it's um, a, a conditional knock-in, is it present only in the cells or tissues you're, you're thinking it should be? And obviously there are a lot of clinical utility for antibody staining uh, in terms of diagnostics, prognostics, biomarkers, and, and that type of thing. So a whole host of, of information that can be gleaned from, from immunostaining. Uh, so some of the <clears throat> nuts and bolts of the immunostaining procedure, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the main thing we're trying to do is detect this antigen antibody complex. And there are two broad ways to do this. There's direct detection and indirect detection. Direct detection was actually the first form of, uh, of immunostaining. It was done fluorescently by uh, conjugating a fluorescent dye molecule, again, to this uh, sort of handle, this FC region, non-antigen binding region of the antibody molecule. And then if your antibody bound to its target, you would wash away all the unbound molecules. And if you check this cell or tissue out <clears throat> under an uh, a fluorescence microscope, then you'd see localized fluorescence uh, where the target was. Um, so that's direct detection. The, again, the, the primary antibody is directly labeled with fluorophore. Indirect, uh, in terms of immunofluorescence, is similar and is much more commonly used today are indirect methods. In this case, uh, the fluorescent tag is actually conjugated to the secondary antibody, not the primary. <clears throat> so when the secondary antibody recognizes the primary, it brings along the fluorophore. And again, you'll get a detection signal localized to the target uh, on your specimen in fluorescence microscopy. This gives you uh, a, a much more uh, uh, easy way to detect multiple antibodies in your lab. So for instance, if you have a lot of rabbit primary antibodies, your fluorescently labeled anti-rabbit antibody would detect any of them in any of your assays. So it's much more convenient. Um, and these secondary antibodies are basically sold as pretty well validated reagents. You can pretty well trust um, these antibodies uh, to do what they say they do. In addition, there's a whole variety of different colors of these fluorescent tags, which can be used, which greatly uh, aids in terms of detecting <clears throat> more than one protein molecule in a tissue by using multiple antibodies, so-called multiplexing. Um, and here's a, a fairly dramatic example of that <clears throat> using multiple uh, targets 
multiple different colors uh, in the fluorescence in immunofluorescence. So um, the other things that are advantages with respect to immunofluorescence is you get excellent uh, subcellular detail and, and, and resolution. Uh, of course, that's assuming you have an excellent microscope. You can actually do quantification of the signals by doing digital image analysis. So the uh, fluorescent intensity of that is read out in the camera pixels of a, of a digital camera. Uh, if it's kept in the linear range are proportional to the amount of the target there. So you can use this uh, to either quantify or, or, or semi-quantify. It's good for 3D microscopy as well. A couple of the disadvantages for using fluorescence is tissues can be quote unquote noisy. There are a lot of compounds in certain tissues that autofluoresce, <laughs> produce their own fluorescent signals and represents in some cases a very, very strong background that may be difficult to overcome. Uh, it's a bit more costly typically than doing uh, standard chromogenic uh, immunohistochemistry. You need a fluorescence microscope, uh, special dyes on your, on your uh, secondary antibodies and, and a whole host of other things. Um, there's also at, at best, there's a loss of uh, surrounding tissue detail. If, you're, if your tissue is very clean in terms of autofluorescence, the only signals you really see are, are the cells that you're targeting. So you're not really getting a lot of good histological cues that you would normally get in the background of say an IHC stain to tell, you know, is this a blood vessel? Is this near uh, a gland, et cetera. Uh, and these dyes are also typically not permanent and will eventually fade, uh, fade away in, in uh, contrast to uh, immunohistochemistry, which we'll talk about next. So immunohistochemistry, uh, again, the, the approaches are, are rather similar to the, what I just described for the fluorescence, except instead of tagging the antibody with a fluorescent dye molecule, you've actually tagged it or conjugated it to an enzyme. And so the enzyme Typically what it does is it takes a colorless substrate solution and turns it into a colored end product that then is somehow localized to the environment of the, of the antibody. Either it precipitates out or there's chemistry included here that actually causes the end product to become covalently linked to the area. And again, this is the typical sort of uh, textbook IHC. Uh, many of you are probably used to seeing. Very often it's this brown color. This is probably the most widely used chromogen in detecting for IHC, it's called DAB, <clears throat> diamino benzidine. It produces a very dark brown uh, or even black color, depending on how concentrated it is. This is uh, just a nice example uh, in terms of prostate cancer. This is a, a biomarker that's actually used diagnostically to help uh, determine whether or not there's cancer present. And you can see here in this example, it's, it's very nice. Uh, these normal epithelial cells in the prostate uh, don't express any of this protein. Uh, cancer cells express a lot of it, so they're very darkly stained in, in comparison to the directly adjacent normal that this cancer is infiltrating into. And then interestingly enough, this precancerous lesion actually uh, produces an intermediate amount of this protein. So pretty nice image here showing that. Like uh, immunofluorescence, you can do a limited amount of multiplexing with IHC using different colored chromogens. Um, it, it's sort of like fluorescence. The only problem is with dyes like this, these are actually what are known as um, subtractive uh, chromogens, subtractive dyes, which means that they, 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 they become colored by absorbing certain wavelengths of light of regular light that, that's being shown upon them. So if you take out, say for instance, the green and the blue, uh, light, then all you're left with is uh, red and you'd get a red color. Uh, the problem with that is when you have more than uh, one or two or three of these dye molecules co-localized or, or on top of one another, so much light is subtracted out that now you get no signal and things turn very dark brown or black. So the ability to, to sort of tease apart how many different um, uh, signals there are here in areas like this becomes becomes a bit difficult and that kind of limits your ability to do uh, multiplexing if your targets are overlapping spatially. Although these, 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 these techniques are getting better and better. Here's a nice example using, I think it was a fourplex, um, also again in prostate cancer, where they took advantage of the fact that the different targets are not spatially co-localized. So you've got brown targets over here, you've got red targets in these cells that don't co-localize with these um, nuclear signals here that are in this sort of blue purple color. So you can get a, you can get very clever with your um, with your detection if you know the expected locations 
uh, and crosstalks possible. <clears throat> um, the other thing to mention is that, again, these days with respect to sensitivity, amplification of the signals in immunostaining both IHC and immunofluorescence has, has advanced uh, significantly over the last several years. And there are now numerous examples. I'm just presenting one in the schematic format here of how this sort of works is you've got your primary and here's your secondary. And instead of conjugating a single uh, molecule of enzyme here, you conjugate multiple molecules of enzymes. There are different ways that this is done. Obviously in this cartoon, this is not really how it's, how it's necessarily done. Um, but the, 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 uh, the product of that is that you generate, catalyze a lot more conversion of your substrate into the chromogen. And so here's a nice example of this where we used a, a, an antibody um, for IHC in, a, in directly adjacent sections. <clears throat> and in this case, we were using, actually, this was actually a, uh, already an amplifying kit. And we got these rather weak to moderate signals here in these glands. Whereas if we used a more powerful kit here, we got much darker staining. You can see in the same areas. In fact, some uh, cells that may have been scored negative or extremely weak here would actually be scored moderate or maybe uh, even strong in some cases. Um, you get a great signal enhancement. You can tell, I mean, the signal intensities here overall are approximately maybe fivefold increased over what's seen with this kit. In addition, it allows you to dilute your antibody out more, your primary antibody. So you actually save on uh, antibody costs, stretch your antibodies out. Uh, in this case, it's a fourfold uh, more dilute solution than this was. So considering the fourfold dilution of the antibody and the maybe fivefold signal enhancement in total, we're getting something on the order of say a 20 fold enhancement of our signals going from this kit uh, to this kit. And if you can imagine without amplification, we probably wouldn't have seen anything at all. So, um, so this is really coming a long ways. It can also be done with immunofluorescence. So in this cartoon, we've got our sort of familiar schematic here, secondary recognizing a primary, recognizing a uh, target, and we got an enzyme here that's actually converting a soluble but, but activatable form of a fluorescent dye molecule here floating around in the solution. It activates that and causes it to become covalently linked in the vicinity of the antibody on the molecular scale. And since it's catalyzing that, it's, it's depositing a lot of these uh, dye molecules. And here's just a, a very nice example where we did this in a tissue where uh, there was a lot of background actually. Uh, we did this for two different uh, lymphocyte markers and we get some very, very nice signals here that are, are so bright, they're, they're, they're completely overshadowing any uh, background fluorescence. You can't even see it here. It looks perfectly black in this tissue. And you can see we get very nice uh, ability to do co-localizations and see subsets of, of lymphocytes that are lit up in green that also express this uh, red um, nuclear protein called FOXP3, which is actually a, a marker of uh, regulatory T lymphocytes. Okay, um, so now I wanna uh, go over again, another uh, thing to be aware of in terms of antibody staining, uh, which is extremely important. And this is where the, the sort of uh, Marvel, uh, uh, Peter Parker principle comes in. If you know your, your Marvel comics and Stan Lee, uh, Peter Parker's uncle tells him that, that with great power comes great responsibility. And this is also true for immunostaining. This is a very powerful technique, but there are some pitfalls that you have to be aware of because you can get absolutely wrong results. And actually the literature, the published literature is actually completely contaminated with this. Um, a problem that has sort of been known and, and people voices in the wilderness have been yelling about for years. It's only now really becoming appreciated over the last couple of years, still um, <clears throat> uh, relatively underappreciated. So there are articles coming out like this, uh, the antibody horror show, and he uh, states the biological literature reverberates with the inadequacies of commercial research tool antibodies. And of course, uh, I think we've all been hearing over the past several years about a potential reproducibility crisis in biomedical research. And there are numerous contributors to this. One in particular are uh, inadequate antibodies. So here's a high profile paper from, I think it was Nature a couple of years ago, blame it on the antibodies. 
And there are all kinds of uh, studies like, like these two here, which are extremely worrisome. So here, the, the Human Protein Atlas tested 5,000 commercially available antibodies, and less than half of them worked for immunohistochemistry in fixed tissues. Uh, here, another company tested 6,000. Greater than three-fourths of them were either nonspecific or non-functional. So this is a big problem. Um, there are a lot of companies out there uh, selling uh, antibodies. They are not all uh, uh, very uh, scrupulous or, or big on quality control. There are millions of antibodies available out there for sale. It's a huge, uh, lucrative global market. So there's a lot of uh, incentives for people to sell even unscrupulous uh, dealers to sell um, uh, less than optimal or, or totally worthless antibodies. Um, and there are millions and millions of dollars lost to the US research enterprise estimated due to bad antibodies. So things that can happen, uh, one, main, one main one is actually specificity that we've already talked about. Antibody specificity can be a real problem. You can generate off-target artifacts uh, relatively easy with non, not greatly specific antibodies. So in the very, very worst case, as some of those papers I, I alluded to earlier, the antibody that you buy does not even recognize the target it's advertised as being specific for. So there you go, you'd get a false negative where your target actually is there and you don't, don't even detect it. Worse, that antibody may go and bind something else and you're gonna get a false positive. And if you don't do adequate positive and negative controls and validations, you would actually be misled into thinking that that false positive signal is your true signal by assuming that the antibody works as advertised. The, the solution to this, unfortunately, uh, and it's a tough pill for some people to swallow because it takes time and effort and some money, but really all antibodies should be validated in-house with rigorous positive and negative controls and optimized on the tissues that are ultimately going to be stained for. Um, there's another thing to know about, and that is that there's a certain amount of batch to batch variability of antibodies. So you may have a great antibody that you, you have validated, it's working fantastically, and you run out of it, and you contact the company and order another tube of it, it comes in, and it, now it's not working the way it used to work. This is especially a problem for polyclonals, because as I mentioned, they are made in animals. By, uh, by injecting antigens into the animals, taking the serum and, and, uh, and purifying those antibodies. So uh, when the stocks of a particular polyclonal lot are, have run out, uh, and if that was made, say, in a rabbit, that rabbit may, not, may no longer be available. So they have to immunize a new animal. The antibodies generated in that new animal are not necessarily going to behave the same way as the first batch. So if you're dealing with polyclonals, and it's important to you to, to have consistency, you want to check and make sure the vendor can sell you the same lot, or you might want to stock up on the same lot up front to, to avoid that problem. Um, so here's an example from David Rim's lab up in Yale. He's been something of a champion of this problem for, for years. And here was uh, back when uh, immuno um, uh, oncology was getting, was getting hot and these immune checkpoint blockade molecules were really uh, coming on, on the stage. He did a, a very rigorous test, and only one of the four antibodies he was commercially available against this key target, PDL1, uh, was validated for specificity. And the way he would do that is he would use known positive control human tissues, such as human placenta. And then he had cell lines where he was uh, positively expressing PDL1 and cell lines where it was knocked out. <clears throat> so it should be dead negative. So this is an example of a good antibody behaving as. Uh, it should. So it's not just sufficient to say do a Western blot and see if you get a band on a gel. So cell line controls are a great way to do antibody validation. And in fact, some companies, some few companies have taken this route and have decided they are going to um, validate their antibodies against cell line controls. You could do this in house. Um, there are a number of ways to do this. Here's an example of one we did that's, again, another scary example where we were trying to get an antibody for a nuclear uh, antigen. Here we had a positive control cell line. We had three different negative 
control cell lines. And in, in none of these three did we get nuclear staining. So that was a very good sign. We do get some blush here. Again, this is some nonspecific or even off target, uh, potentially effect of antibodies. This is often seen actually. And if you tighter the antibodies up, you can get beautiful dark staining. So you can pretty much turn anything brown that you want to, if you're not careful. Once you know that you've got negativity in the compartment you're interested in, and you could do companion Western blots and show it's not binding to the protein of interest. Um, you can play with conditions here and optimize to try and actually get rid of this background stain by diluting out the antibody, uh, uh, lowering the incubation time of the antibody, et cetera. There are ways to get around that. But at the bare, bare minimum, you have to be able to see positive where it should be positive and negative where it should be negative. Here's another antibody for the same target from a different vendor. Looks great again on the controlled tissues, the positives, but the negatives amazingly have beautiful nuclear staining. These are knockout cells that have been confirmed genetically and by Westerns. So this signal is not the target of interest. Yet, if you didn't know that, you would say, oh, it must be working because you're getting beautiful nuclear staining. So again, this is, a, this is a, one of the frightening examples to show you how, how wrong antibody staining can go. And if you don't do the validation, you're gonna get results that are sort of are confirming your bias about what you're expecting to see. And God knows what in actual experimental systems or tissues you would see and what erroneous conclusions you would, you would generate um, and, and potentially publish and be dead wrong. That's what you've got to avoid. So again, these cell line controls can be extremely valuable in validating antibodies. So how do you find them? Luckily, these days, it's, it's, it's much easier than it used to be. There are great resources. For instance, here, the, the, the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia from the Broad Institute has over a thousand uh, cell lines characterized, and you can rapidly search them and find cells that are either positive or negative for your target of interest, um, and probably relatively easily obtain them if somebody down the hall doesn't already have them. Uh, you can also make control cell lines much more uh, easily than we used to be able to using RNAi, or these days you can use CRISPR to actually completely knock out a gene, or you can knock in a gene or, or transiently transfect an expression vector. So you can generate positive and negative controls relatively easily if you wanna do it yourself. Other resources include things like the Human Protein Atlas that I mentioned before, their goal is to basically create a, a, a comprehensive atlas of all expressed human proteins and all expressed tissues, including also cell lines, both diseased and normal states of tissues. And they've been doing this for a number of years and are really um, uh, coming out with a lot of good, good resources, although they're not, not yet perfect. It's very helpful to be able to find and identify uh, say tissues that you may be able to use as rigorous positive and negative controls um, for your validations. You can also do this through other sources. There's one called GTEx. There are other expression level sources where you can see, you can find um, expression level uh, databases of human tissues, find uh, tissues that ne never express any RNA, so they would not be expected to be making the protein. Uh, although the caveat being, as I mentioned before, even if they are expressing RNA, it actually does not mean that they are going to be expressing much of or any of the protein that you're interested in detecting if that's your target. So you've got to be a little, little wary of that. <clears throat> Getting a negative result from a, a tissue expressing the RNA of your target of interest doesn't necessarily mean that that antibody is bad. Um, other resources, especially in terms of finding candidate antibodies, because again, there are all these companies out there. You can uh, e easily do a Google image search for your target of interest, uh, plus the word antibody or immunofluorescence if you're interested in doing IF, and you'll get galleries and galleries of images, and you can quickly page through and look for things that actually look at least like they have a reasonable chance of being good. Are they localized to the right tissues? Are they localized to the right compartments of the tissues? Does the staining look clean? You still have to do a lot of uh, looking into that antibody to see what the data looks like in terms of the quality. Um, but at least it's, it's a start. Also the published literature, there is good data out there. Again, like people like, like, uh, like RIM publishing uh, assays for, for antibodies uh, and doing, doing uh, validations and, and, and things like that. But again, a lot of the primary literature is actually polluted. I, I mean, I would not be, I, I think off by saying probably near half of what is published in terms of antibody staining, both immunofluorescence and IHC, 
is probably not correct. And it's not policed well by referees. It's, it's been very easy over the years for people to publish um, uh, just a single panel of, of, of a figure that, that, is, that is actually probably not correct. So you can't really rely on that as well without looking into the details in the paper and to see, did they validate their antibodies or did they use antibodies that somebody else had thoroughly validated? And you can't just assume that they're using an antibody that was previously published, uh, that that antibody was initially thoroughly validated. You have to kind of backtrack and go look and, and, and do some uh, due diligence to see if that's the case. Because again, it's, 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 it's uh, fraught with peril to rely on just saying, oh, there was a publication by this antibody, it must be correct. And it'll work in my hands, on my tissues, under my fixation conditions and my retrieval, even though they're, they were using liver and I'm going to be using, you know, colon. Um, those are important, important things to keep in mind. Antibody data sheets, certainly very important, <clears throat> give you all kinds of useful information and can refer you to references. And particularly, uh, some companies will show you how they actually validated if they did validate things like Western blots, hopefully they did knock out, knock in cells, or things like that. Although not many companies go to those great lengths yet. Uh, a couple of them are in response to this problem. Okay, so for the um, last portion of the talk here, I just wanted to go over what is probably one of the most exciting uh, and innovative aspects of, of immunostaining these days is this issue of being able to do higher order multiplexing, that is putting uh, many antibodies onto the same tissue and detecting them all simultaneously and be able to parse them out. So you're going to get a lot more information from a single tissue uh, section than you would by doing one or two antibodies. Um, uh, and immunofluorescence is where this really shines, although it does, again, work to some extent uh, by immunohistochemistry. There are a lot of um, different protocols now coming out, different methods in this area. There are a lot of good reviews. Here's just one I'd recommend you to, if, to you if you're interested at all in this type of technique. Um, we've used a number of different strategies. I'll go over a couple of them here just to give you a feel for what's available, but this is by no means exhaustive. Um, and these, these techniques are being refined and new ones are coming out, uh, seems like every month. So this is a very hot area uh, with a lot of potential uh, for very powerful uh, technology. So again, in traditional uh, fluorescent staining, what we usually do is throw on one or two or maybe three antibodies and we'll detect them in three different colors, say red, green, and blue. Um, and under the fluorescence microscope, you can select these channels out individually and image them and then combine the images later into a single image. But you can see these individual channels separately very well because you can use special filter sets to largely exclude the, uh, the contribution of colors coming from the other uh, channels, from the other antibodies <clears throat> that are on the same tissue under the microscope. But that only works to a point, because if you start piling on more and more antibodies with more and more unique colors uh, to be able to uniquely identify them, you start running into this crosstalk problem, <clears throat> a lot of spectral overlap. And now you can't really detect specifically this color versus this color versus this color because there's so much overlap. You can't get uh, filters that are fine enough to discriminate these individually. That's a big problem. Now, there've been a number of techniques um, uh, put forward over the last few years to try and, and overcome this problem. Uh, one I'll show you is called multispectral imaging. It's a rather uh, older technique. I think it's from about 1960 or 70s, first developed actually by the military to deal with multicolor uh, satellite imagery from battlefields to try and uh, detect, say, for instance, uh, enemy uh, tanks that are hiding under foliage, things of that nature. Um, and this is an example where uh, there's been uh, three different, uh, sorry, seven different antibodies bound to the same tissue, each of which has its own unique fluorescent color. So it's getting into this area here where there's a lot of spectral overlap. And you can kind of see some of the, okay, there's the pink and there's the green, but then you get into areas where these things are overlapped and it's hard to tell who's where and how much, et cetera. What multispectral imaging does is it deconvolutes out the individual spectra from the entire image of each of the individual dyes and identifies them uniquely. And so that's what's been done here. And so the computer has deconvoluted this complex image into pseudo images of each of the individual channels, which you can see in these squares around the edge. 
Um, this was actually done by Dr. Taub here uh, at our institution. It's a very uh, instrument and computationally intensive uh, method requires special instrumentation and, and, and usually special um, te technical help, uh, but it can be done. And this is the type of information you can get out of this, as well as other types of, of multiplex IF. You can you know, uniquely identify certain cell types, get, get feels for distances and distributions and who's near whom, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a very nice technique once you get it up and running. It can be a bit uh, uh, onerous to get this working though. Um, another uh, interesting uh, uh, offshoot of this multiplex idea is actually to not use a microscope at all, but instead use uh, mass spectrometry. And what's done here is instead of labeling the antibodies with unique fluorescent dyes, what they are labeled with is basically mass tags or, or uh, isotopes of different molecular weight. And then that is all these antibodies are put on your sample and then what happens is a very high resolution um, uh, beam is used to, to blast this apart and these things fly through the mass spec and you identify who is present by the isotopes here. And then you can get some quantitative information also on how much of them were present at that particular spot. And you scan across your entire specimen and, and basically generate this giant data set which you can kind of consider as being very similar to this multiplex um, spectral imaging type of thing where you get sort of a spectral cube of unmixed um, individual antibodies. Uh, and this is, this is really coming along. Uh, again, it requires very special expensive uh, 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 equipment to do this obviously, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, companies vying for this technology and presumably prices will come down. Um, the last one I wanted to show is one using actually standard uh, immunofluorescence, which is a very interesting idea here. It came out a couple of years ago from Gary Nolan's lab in um, Stanford. It's called Codex. And the idea here is, is actually fairly simple. It is that you basically take uh, your antibodies and you conjugate onto them uh, a barcode, which is um, a, a, a DNA, uh, unique DNA uh, sequence tag onto each individual antibody. So here in this uh, simple example, they've got three different, or sorry, six different antibodies. So you're trying to detect six different targets, antibody one, two, three, four, five, six, each class of antibodies. So all the antibody ones have this tag on it, uh, antibody two has this tag on it. It's a different sequence, et cetera, et cetera. So they all have unique tags. And you do this in cycles. So it's kind of like this old uh, uh, shampoo commercial where you're going to do an uh, application, a rinse off, and then a repeat application. So in this case, they've added now uh, fluorescent dyes that are conjugated to um, complementary sequences that bind specifically to these antibodies' uh, biotag here, barcode. So now you've uh, basically identified antibody one and antibody two in this cycle, you image it. So you could just get a two color image, which is very clear and clean. You can tell them apart very easily. That's great. Now you have a way to chemically remove these dye molecules and you're back to a completely barren uh, uh, sample. Now you come in with newly fluorescent dye tagged barcode responders that recognize these two antibodies instead of these two by their barcode unique sequences. Do the same thing, you image, now you get a different pattern of image and you repeat that. The third, third cycle, you get two more. So you have now generated uh, images that specifically show you where each of these six antibodies lay in the same tissue section. And then the computer overlays those images into a single uh, image to get um, something along the lines of, of that look, would look like this. Um, so this is a very interesting idea. You know, you're not trying to spectrally unmix lots and lots of different overlapping antibodies. And in theory, you can do this over and over and over again. And the inventor of this technique claims to have done it, I think up to four for 40 different antibodies. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, technique. There's a commercial product sold that does this uh, automatically with a microscope and a flow cell. Uh, so this is just an example of, of where this field is, is going. And here's some of the data they've shown uh, where they do this and they suit a color, all the cells later. Um, and you can tell, you can see where all these different cell types are, who's interacting with whom, uh, cell neighborhoods, cell areas. 
all kinds of data you can get out from that. Okay, so again, that's just a, a brief overview of the type of things you can do with multiplexing. There, there are other platforms and, and new things coming on down the pike. So this type of approach is only going to get uh, better, more powerful, and, and presumably uh, less expensive. So that basically concludes what I was uh, going to cover in this roughly 45 minutes. In summary, immunostaining is an extremely powerful, informative technique. Uh, the two main ways of, of, of looking at immunostaining is either by immunofluorescence or IHC, although there are other ways, such as the CYTOF, which is the, the MS type uh, approach of detection. Um, it utilizes the, the uh, great amount of antibody diversity <clears throat> to be able to develop antibodies to detect and localize biomolecules and tissues. And you can then even quantify um, the amount of that molecule that's present there. Its utility, obviously, for all these different uh, realms of, of biosciences. And again, multiplexing is really the up and coming uh, technique here. It saves on tissue, it's, it can potentially save on reagents and whatnot when you're doing a lot in the single tissue, especially if you're using uh, fairly uh, precious clinical samples potentially obtained from patients, uh, both uh, immunohistochemical chromogenic methods as well as immunofluorescence can be done in multiplex formats, although we did discuss the potential problems of doing high plex on uh, tissues with uh, chromogenic IHC because of the overlap problem and the fact that you start losing the ability to, um, to uniquely identify who's present and how much is there. That's where immunofluorescence really shines and that's where this field is really getting pushed uh, to the next level. Um, we also discussed a number of potential pitfalls to become aware of if you want to use this very uh, important and, 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 and potentially powerful technique, you've got to be careful because there are uh, issues with potential uh, pre-analytical variables such as fixation can have major impacts on your downstream uh, protocols. There is a lack of standardization by and large from lab to lab and, and center to center in terms of things like, like fixation as well as uh, tissue processing. And if they're doing immunostaining, uh, things like antigen retrieval. So you want to become a, be aware of that to avoid issues having to do potentially with, with those types of issues. Um, antibody quality concerns are still a major, major problem in the field. And they can uh, easily generate false positives and, and or false negatives, both of which can, can just kill your results. Um, and, and, and make you, again, come to false conclusions. And again, be aware that the past literature, especially the older literature, is, is actually absolutely littered with these types of results. Um, so, so caveat emptor, take with a grain of salt any antibody staining results you see in papers or grant applications or seminars, uh, unless they can say that they thoroughly validated those uh, those antibodies and that staining method to make sure those results are accurate. The way around this is uh, if you're doing your own antibody staining or if you're relying on someone else and you really need that information to be true and 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 you can you can rely on it, then you've got to make sure that they're doing this. There's got to be due diligence in terms of validation and optimization uh, of of staining using rigorous positive and negative controls. Uh, to make sure that these things are valid and then optimizing uh, and on um, the tissues of interest that you're uh, eventually going to be using them on. Okay, so that is all I had for this uh, brief time we had together. Uh, and I thank you for your uh, attention. And again, uh, please feel free to contact me at the email address I listed in the first slide if you have any comments or questions, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to people about uh, immunostaining. I've done this for about 25 years. So I think I've seen just about everything. All right, so take care and uh, good luck out there. Generate some great data. Bye now. <laughs>